Wurundjeri, and welcome to our panel discussion today, Women in Sports Tech, for the Victorian Digital Innovation Festival. My name's Emma Sherry, and I'm a director at the Swinburne University Sport Innovation Group and a member of the Australian Sport Innovation Centre of Excellence Advisory Board. And it's my pleasure to be your host for this morning's event. Before we continue, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to pay my respects to traditional owners of the lands of those watching this event online. We have a wonderful event for you all this morning as part of the Digital Innovation Festival with a panel of experts in all things sport and tech with a focus on women's engagement, employment and advancement in this growing and important sector. In recent years, we have seen an increased focus on the role of women in the sport industry, both on and off the field. Here in Victoria, we are leading the way with the establishment of the Office for Women in Sport and Recreation that has the remit to advance gender equity in the sector. Initiatives like this and those across Australia, such as the Sport Australia and Australian Institute of Sport Women's Leadership Programs have shone a light on the barriers to women's engagement in the sports sector, but also more importantly, the benefits of engaging women as volunteers, employees, leaders and entrepreneurs. However, the sport tech sector is one that has had less focus or attention on the participation of and opportunities for women. Sport tech provides both the foundation of our sports through digital platforms to engage fans, apps and software to manage our businesses, on-field advances in equipment, clothing and analytics, and so much more. Sport tech is also an aspect of the sector that is growing exponentially. And as Australia is focused on an extraordinary number of major events in the lead up to the 2032 Olympic Games in Brisbane, and our own Victorian Regional Commonwealth Games in 2026, now is the time to put opportunities for women's participation and leadership of sport tech and innovation front and centre. I cannot wait to hear from our experts and learn from our, their experiences this morning. We have four amazing speakers with us today, Bianca from Sport Radar, Iris from GSIC, Todd from the University of Washington, Seattle, and Jasmine, a director of the Australian Sports Tech Network. I will be asking each speaker to introduce themselves and their, tell us a bit about their organisation. And then we will work our way through a QA and a with the panel. I really hope you enjoy the session and thank you to our speakers and the ASTN for the opportunity to engage this discussion. Bianca, I'd really like to start with you. Um, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Sport Radar? Yeah, absolutely. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Bianca Keel. I'm the Interim Co-Chief People Officer at Sport Radar. Um, I recently returned from Europe actually. I was living in Switzerland for 10 years. Um, you may hear from my accent, I'm Australian. Um, and so returned home uh, to Australia to, yeah, raise my children, or our children, together with my husband. I have had the opportunity to open um, the Melbourne office here uh, for Sport Radar, which has been absolutely fantastic, together with the Australian Sports Technology Network. We've been partnering with them um, to open um, the, the office here. So we have 40 employees based here in, in Melbourne um, for Sport Radar and uh, about 60 in total across uh, the country. Globally, we are three, just over 3,000 employees now um, and we're a sports technology company um, headquartered in Switzerland. And um, yeah, we support sports um, uh, and also media companies as well as uh, betting. Uh, industry. Fantastic, thank you. Now I've heard that Sport Radar has developed a Women in Tech initiative. Can you tell us a little bit about that program? We certainly have. So this is um, one element of our DE&I uh, strategic approach that we have and specifically the, the Women in Tech program was established um, to support just that, to support women who are wanting to drive um, within the, the technology industry. Now, this is an employee bottom-up initiative as part of our um, strategic DEI. Um, so it's one, one element, one pillar. Now, we created this DEI program um, that was linked to our overall strategic goals because we know that um, companies that have diverse 
um, uh, leadership teams, but also organisations and teams are 45 per cent more likely to be financially um, better off than their competitors within their industry. So that's why that was really important for us to establish that, that foundation. And then as part of that, a bottom-up approach. So our employees who were genuinely passionate, and that was our, we have a big engineering group, we have 700 engineers within our organisation. Um, and some of our leaders within that organisation and employees were incredibly passionate about this women in tech group. So they established this group, which in essence, um, they have been doing external, internal events. Uh, we recently were in Warsaw in Poland where we did a big um, uh, event, external event, which was absolutely brilliant. We had, I think, 150 leads to uh, recruitment leads as part of that initiative that we did. We have women in tech virtual backgrounds. Um, we have uh, swag, unfortunately I'm not wearing mine today, um, which I was telling El Emma earlier that that was a result of uh, children. Um, so the epitome of, of being a woman in, in technology. Uh, so we have all of those um, those things that, that are completely backed by our leadership team. Our CEO was recently off-site um, at a management team that we had management team meeting that we had in Tyrol in Austria and he was proudly wearing his his women in tech uh, hoodie so that's what our, our women in tech uh, venture is all about and and I'm incredibly proud to be part of that that's venture. fantastic thank you um, I know that sports radar seeks to attract the best of the best in sport tech can you explain to our audience how um, your organization and the sport tech industry more broadly can work to attract women into tech and, and explain and provide opportunities on this career path? Yeah, absolutely. That That's the key element of our external events that we're doing, as well as internal. So internal internally what we're doing is we are um, educating our hiring managers. We are educating those, our talent acquisition team, of the importance of bringing women into the sector, in, into our teams as well, and the, the diverse, um, elements that, that women bring to that. So that's teaching them about unconscious bias, bringing that to their attention so that they're aware of perhaps what their unconscious biases might be. So that, that's the way we're addressing that internally. We also have our events, we have our virtual backgrounds, which bring awareness to, hey, this is something that's so important to us as um, as a company and then externally it's doing those events it's participating and sponsoring events where we're, we're demonstrating our commitment to women in technology the next phase will be really partnering further with universities we have started to do that already but this is certainly an, uh, an area where we see an opportunity to to continue to uh, evolve that fantastic thank you so much Iris, over to you. Can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your organisation? Sure. I'm Iris Cordova, the General Manager of the Global Sport Innovation Centre powered by Microsoft, a very big name. Originally I am from Argentina, but I have lived in 18 years in Spain and now I'm living in Singapore. Uh, and from the last 20 years, I've worked in LinkedIn to support a small and medium-sized company uh, from the public sector. I worked more than 10 years in the Ministry of Economic in Argentina, and then I went to uh, Spain and worked promoting uh, cluster sectors uh, focusing on sport, entertainment, and education. And currently, uh, I'm set up, the, I'm leading the expansion of the GSIC. Our headquarters is in Madrid. What is the GSIC? The GSIC was the first innovation uh, center with the philosophy of the cluster, but international cluster. We are currently more than 300 companies from 48 different countries working to promote the digital transformation. It's supported and powered by Microsoft. This is mean we try to promote 
uh, use the Microsoft technology. Why we open our first office in Madrid is because the first partnership that Microsoft uh, got in the sport was with the Real Madrid Football Club. We are talking about in 2015 when the sport industry started the digital transformation. I think the pandemic today accelerated the use of technology, but at this moment the GSIC was referenced and uh, we can inspire a lot of other initiative in this sense because when we talk about sport, sport is health, sport is uh, tourism, sport is uh, entertainment, sport is education. No? And, and I think uh, that's it. No? This, is, this is me. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. It's, um, it's great to have you here to give us a global perspective. Um, and as a global leader in sport tech with all the work that you've been doing over the years, can you speak to us a little bit about gender diversity in the international sport tech ecosystem or in the industry? Yes, it's, it's a big question. No? I think uh, the gender equity uh, is yet a challenge. You know, if you see about um, the data, uh, about the representative the women in the national federation is very small. Uh, if you think about Spain, uh, 59 uh, federation, only three chairmen are women. But if you look for the rest of the Europe, the situation is the same. Only the 14% of the decision market position in the sport organization are women. No, it's very, very small. Uh, but uh, I believe the sport is very diverse. No, I, talking about the sport is uh, tourism, the sport is the relationship with the fans, the sport is health. But the people who are behind the sport using the technology will be diverse too. No, but uh, I see in this sense a big problem, and is the student uh, and the girls. No? I think if we want to promote more uh, women uh, in the sport tech industry, we need to start at the school no? with the girls, uh, inspire them. This is why these kind of activities for me are very relevant because the way to inspire other women is stay here and talk with them. In the GSIC, we have the showcase in Madrid and in Singapore where we show how the technology is transforming the sport industry. We have like HoloLens, augmented reality, virtual reality, um, a lot of things that were um, helmet with sensor. Um, and we invite not only the university student, the secondary or the high school, and show this and inspire to study more STEM career, no? because if we want to uh, get a more quota of women leader the sport tech, we need to start at the school and inspire this, this girl, girl and invite them uh, to study. If we, if we see some data, uh, the, according to the, the research of the powerhouse uh, consultancy company, uh, according to the research, only 83% of the boys in the high school opt for a STEM uh, subject, um, and women only the 64%. At the university, then only the 30% of the female take STEM courses. No, and if you think in engineers' courses, uh, this gap is even bigger, and only the fourth you know, it's, it's very uh, small. This is, this is maybe uh, some government, for example, in the Spain, if you want to get a grant uh, for the National Federation, they have a quota where uh, most of the 33% of the board of a committee of this uh, organization must be women. No? I don't know if the best way uh, to promote the women uh, in the federation, but it's true. No, but I believe we need to start with with the school. Fantastic. Now you've worked um, from Argentina, worked in Spain, now in Singapore. Have a bit like I asked 
Bianca, have you seen initiatives or programs or events um, that have that have started to work to try and create this change? Yeah, sure. Um, we a mm, few years ago uh, asked about our ecosystem, how many women funded their company from three hundred members, only the six percent of our members are uh, funded for women. In this sense, Microsoft has different programs to help the women in the sport. Uh, we create a manifesto where, uh, with a lot of points, for example, no women, no panel in all the activities that we run of the GACC. We run more than 100 activities per year. Uh, and again, we believe in the visibility that they need, and this is why we, when we detect uh, women in our ecosystem, we try to give visibility. Uh, we support several international sport events. We always offer the possibility uh, to invite women. Um, we are supporting different ranking in, in the sport industry in Europe and in Latin America. We are very linking, I think, because my Spanish is better than in English and I will try to support uh, in, in a Spanish language, but I'm part of different ranking to, to get visibility and I think it's the way where we can, we can help. We organize events not only uh, March 8th, we organize events uh, from women all the time and we try to, to because really I, I, I think it's visibility, they need technology support and investment. No? And when you talk with VC, uh, when the company is funded for women, the risk uh, is less than the men. And why is that we have mo less company leading for women for the VC and the fund is better invest when the funder is woman, no? because they have soft skill different than the men. No? And, and, and we have uh, also the working group focused in women, and, and that's it. Fantastic, thank you. So I think what we've heard is that if you can't see it, it's much harder to be it. So that visibility seems to be really, yeah. really key for both of the programs we've heard about so far. Todd, thank you for being our gender diversity on the panel today. It's very much appreciated having you here. And your American diversity. Yes, correct. Um, can you tell us, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your work? Thanks so much. Um, first, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Management and Organization at the University of Washington, uh, which is located in Seattle, and I'm also an attorney. Um, the focus of my work and my teaching is, is traditionally on uh, law and ethics um, with a specific focus on the intersection of businesses, government, and society. So I happen to be in Australia this week um, with a collection of 22 American University students where we will have the opportunity to meet with leaders in uh, the business sector and government and NGOs. And later this work week, we're very fortunate to be meeting with the leadership of one of the AFL uh, women's uh, professional leagues. So um, we are open and, and happy to be here to, to learn a great deal more about uh, Australia. And I'm happy to lend my presence uh, and some observations about um, the state of this in the United States. Thank you so much and thank you to the students for joining us too. You're all sitting beautifully quietly while we record today's event. Um, Todd, it's the 50 year anniversary of Title IX in the US. Um, can you tell our audience a bit, for those who might not know, what Title IX is and your reflections on it and its impact um, on creating change for women in sport? Absolutely. Um, the United States did celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX uh, this past June. And as I think about Title IX and how Title IX has affected women in the United States, there are several words that come to mind that I think help encapsulate it. Um, first is durability. Uh, second is opportunity. And the third word that I think is helpful in thinking about Title IX is scope. So durability I think is the starting point because when we think about a statute that the United States Congress passed in 19, 
1973. Uh, um, it's important also to remember what other things were occurring in the United States at the same time. There was a 10-month period between 1972 and 1973 where three really significant things happened that advanced women in the United States, um, and uh, only two of those three things are still intact. Um, the first thing that occurred during this 10-month stretch was the United States Senate passed a bill called the Equal Rights Amendment. And it was uh, supposed to be an amendment to the United States Constitution, but it required the states to then ratify it. The states never succeeded in ratifying the ERA. Uh, shortly after the ERA was passed in the Senate, um, President Nixon signed legislation on Title IX, and that's still intact 50 years later. And then the final uh, advancement for many women was the Supreme Court's decision in Roe versus Wade. And I think even in Australia, you've likely got word that the United States reversed Roe versus Wade a couple of months ago. So when I think about Title IX, I think about the durability of it, that even the past 50 years, because it's a statute, it could easily be amended by the United States Congress. That hasn't happened. It's remained intact, and it's survived through nine different presidential administrations and multiple changes of Congress. So it's been an incredibly durable law out there. <coughs> Um, the other word that I think helps describe Title IX, and, and I think it probably it would be wise for me to just read it uh, so everyone sort of understands what this statute is. Even my American students, I think, are vaguely aware of what Title IX says, um, and my guess is that Australians are, are probably also vaguely aware. So what Title IX says <coughs> is, quote, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. And that essentially means that if you are an educational program in the United States, be it at the elementary, secondary, or college level, and you're receiving any federal funds, you can't discriminate against women on the basis of sex. And so the import of this particular statute in the United States is that it really has expanded the opportunity for women to engage in uh, athletics to achieve their full potential. And we've seen so many examples of this. You know, I think 20 years ago, if we were to talk about male athletes who you'd know who they are based upon their first names, Everyone would, we'd know, everyone would know uh, when we threw out the name Michael and LeBron, who we're talking about. Um, but I think today, we all know uh, who Serena is um, without using a last name. And we all uh, know other uh, women athletes without using last names. So there's been tremendous opportunity advancements. Um, I have a friend in Seattle who I ha have come in as a guest speaker in my classes, a woman named Trish Bostrom who's in her early 70s. And if you're quite old in Australia, you'll recall her as a competitor at the Australian Open. She was rated in the top five doubles players uh, in the world. And when she comes to my classes, she begins by talking about how terrible things were prior to Title IX, where when she was competing as the top women tennis player in the, in the west coast of the United States, she was sleeping on couches, and she was paying for her own transportation. And you know, all of that has changed. Of the 16 women that I have with me on this trip to Australia, uh, 12 or 13 have indicated to me that they played competitive high school sports um, while they were in school. And, and those are really significant advancements for women in the United States. It's fantastic, and I think that's the, the key of the sport ecosystem in the US is education-based until you get to the professional league. So it is a bit different to what we've got here. Um, in Australia, so it's great to see those insights. Todd, can you think of any um, specific results or any real tangible examples that this piece of, I'm going to call it legislation, but I don't know if that's the right word, um, has had on, on sport in particular? Well, I think uh, soccer, football, I think is the, the best exemplar of uh, success. Uh, the United States women's soccer team or football team, uh, I, I think generally is regarded as the most successful women's uh, sports team um, in, in soccer and football in the last 50 years, uh, four World Cup titles, four Olympic gold medals. 
Um, and all of that begins so much earlier. Uh, it begins when, uh, when, when, when children are much younger and taking place, uh, playing sports in elementary schools and secondary schools. And Title IX uh, created an avenue where schools opened up other opportunities, opened up more scholarships for women to participate. Um, personally, I've seen this in my own immediate family. One of my four, uh, one of my three nieces played Division I soccer and got a full academic scholarship to play four years of Division I soccer at the University of Oregon. Um, and in the past year, I had three students who were all on full academic athletic scholarships uh, in my classes. They were all varsity members of our tennis team. So we see individual examples of, of women being able to take advantage of these opportunities that put them on an even playing field, but we also see it uh, systemically. And I think women's soccer, I think, is probably the best, the best example of just success um, across the board. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Todd, for giving us that perspective. Now, Jasmine, you've been really patient. Thank you for sitting so patiently beside me. Can I get you to introduce yourself and a bit about the ASTN? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Very happy to be here. My name is Jasmine and very honoured to be part of this panel and it's been an interesting discussion this morning so far. So um, I'm originally from Singapore, where Iris lives now, and mm. been in Melbourne for the last 10 years. So I work at the Victoria Racing Club, which is actually one of the oldest and um, most pre prestigious horse racing club in Australia. And I work in the international development and marketing and business development space, um, promoting an event called the Melbourne Cup Carnival, which is one of the oldest and most famous horse racing um, event in the world. Um, I also sit on the board of the Australia Sports Tech Network. Now, it's run by a very passionate group of individuals that uh, look at promoting, commer commercialising and developing sports technology uh, within Australia to the global stage. Um, we run several programs every year, including early stage mentoring, growth mentoring, open innovations, um, really with the aim to connect startups and bus to businesses that are mutually beneficial to develop the sports tech industry. Fantastic, thank you. Um, as a director, I know that you'll have all this on the top of your mind and maybe on your piece of paper. <laughs> yes. Can you share with us some of the, the stats and insights around the scale and scope of this industry here in Australia? Of course. Um, now, back in 2017, there was a study that was done by Startup Victoria that actually showed the gap in um, uh, diversity, um, uh, probably among female co-founders or founders of sports tech uh, uh, companies. And, and that figure, um, companies within the sports and recreation sector, there was only 4% um, or 5% of those companies were led by female. Now, when you compare it to the other sectors, right at the top, we've got companies from social enterprises, from design sectors, from real estate. Those numbers are beyond 40%. So there's a massive gap back in 2017, and I don't think that numbers has increased a lot more even today. Um, so that's actually room for us to really improve in that area. Now, within the ASTN programs that we run together with GSIC, um, our figures are 10% of the participants within the accelerator program are actually female-led. Now, that's a great number, which is above industry average, but there's still a massive gap that we need to fill. Um, so we at ASTN really want to be part of that change, and we want to make sure that we look at how can we actually um, promote females from different sectors to join the sports tech sector. There's someone in the design industry has very transferable scale that can bring to the sports tech sector. So we actually want to put up programs um, to actually do that. Um, I'm actually quote you a few examples and figures from the industry that I work in, which is the racing industry. Um, in Australia, or rather at the club itself, we are over 160 years old. We are a very, very traditional male-dominated industry. If you're not sure, if you, if you don't know about horse racing, if you think about the jockeys and the trainers and the breeders, you tend to think that, well, they're mostly male. Um, it was not till 1966 that the first female actually got her, her training license. Prior to that, if you were female and you won a race, you were actually not allowed to go up and collect your trophy. You have to have a male representation to be there to collect on your behalf. So you're actually not recognised. Um, even back then at the club itself where I work, females were actually not able to be seen. There's actually a physical white line that women has to stand behind to actually attend a race. Now, that's, as a woman, that's actually really tragic. Um, but today, of course, that's actually changed. And 
There are some really great female um, within industry now that's actually trailblazing. You know, Todd, you mentioned the name Serena Williams uh, within tennis, but within racing, we've got um, a trainer named Gay Waterhouse. If you talk about Gay Waterhouse, everybody knows who she is because she's trained some really great horses that won many races. Uh, Michelle Payne is a household name now in Australia. She's the first female that won the Melbourne Cup in 2015. So everybody knows who Michelle Payne is and there's even a movie that's made of her called Right Like a Girl. I highly recommend you watch it. Really great story about um, how she overcome, as a female, how she actually overcome the challenges of being a female jockey. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that within racing is the only sport that the female jockey and the male jockey compete on the same level. So you'll never see a race that only has female jockeys or male jockeys. Yeah. So the feel is the same. So women train under similar circumstances. There's no difference. Um, it's moving in the right direction. Females are being recognized, but there's still a massive gap in having to close that gap and making sure that uh, female lead the way within the industry. Um, I want to talk about sports administration. And we talk about on and off field. Now, off the field where I work, um, it was not too long ago that we had our first female chairperson. Now, we are an organisation that's over 150 years old, and we only have the first female chairperson back in 2017. And my name is Amanda Elliott. She was um, leading the organisation for three years. Um, and in the last 12 months, um, our leadership team went from one female out of five to five out of 11. So that went from 20% to 45%. So that's a massive change, a massive leap for a very, very male-dominated industry that's very, very traditional. So we definitely are moving in the right direction, but I think the whole sports industry needs to get on board. We need to make sure that every sport or every sports-related organisation actually do attract females and invite them to take leadership position. And, and from the organisation, ASTN, we want to be part of that change. Um, before we move into the next, um, the winding up of today, can you let us know um, about the activities that the ASTN is planning? They're looking at different ways to bring women into sport innovation and sport tech. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those activities that the ASTN is, is hoping to run with supports of different funding schemes and different governments? Yeah, um, it's actually probably echoing a lot of what Bianca and Iris has actually shared. And we've actually partnered with an organisation called Women in Sports Tech or WSIT. In short, um, they are actually based out in the US. Um, we want to address, address three really important areas where we can actually help women step into leadership position. Um, and this program with um, quite aptly named, um, I have that name somewhere here, with uh, Accelerating Female Founders in Spot Tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the three areas that we want to address is number one, we're going to provide uh, priority to access the program that we run, the ASTN and GSIC pre-accelerator program. Now, this program itself, we want to open up to other sectors, especially sectors within the STEM industry, as um, Iris had mentioned. Um, those industries, you know, the likes of AI, robotics, the Internet of Things, blockchain, um, they would facilitate knowledge transfers from those industry into sports tech area. And, and that would actually lead to innovation organically. Mm -hmm. So that cross-pollination of ideas would absolutely lead to new ideas being formed. The second area we really want to address is provide one-on-one -on -one mentorship to these candidates. Uh, we want to identify female leaders and entrepreneurs who's made uh, progress or been very successful in their areas, not just within Australia, but globally to provide uh, entrepreneurial education to our female candidates, um, help them understand the business of sport. And this is really helping them understand their career path. Mm -hmm and to take up roles that's beyond traditional roles that women are known to take, like administrative support, exec executive assistants and secretaries, to help understand that they can step into leadership positions in a sports tech area. Now, the last one is probably an enabler. Uh, we're going to provide scholarships to women to take up a program um, at the University of Berkeley, which is uh, Women in Leadership. Now, when, upon completion of that program, what they can do is they can work with women in sports tech as the organisation that we mentioned about earlier, and help them pitch to venture capitalists, to VCs, to seek funding for their ideas and businesses. Now, the conversation we have with women in sports tech and many other organisations that we're actually talking to, that's part of ongoing dialogue around you know, diversity, equality and inclusion that we're talking today. And with those diversity, as I think Bianca mentioned, comes 
innovation and growth and that's what we want to be part of that change. Absolutely and I think that's the key message isn't it that innovation is really just a, a big word for change and I think if we can create social innovation, sport innovation, technology innovation it's all about creating positive change. Um, thank you everybody. I'm going to pull some thoughts together that I think we've captured from today and then I'm going to throw you an unprepared question but I'm going to give you the question now so you can start thinking about it which is why should a woman come and work in sport tech or a sport innovation area. So I'm going to let you think about that while I do some closing thoughts. I think what we've heard about today is that there is no reason why there shouldn't be more women in sport sector, there shouldn't be more women in sport innovation and sport technology. And what we've heard about today from our different speakers is that there's a lot of different levers, um, incentives, programs that are out there that we can continue to build and grow to encourage women into this sector. So legislation change, um, we've seen that with Title IX in the US, we've seen that as I said here in Victoria with the Office for Women in Sport and Recreation setting gender quotas. We, we talked about where the quotas work, we've talked about the idea of this program will not run if there is no woman in the room. So there are some really material, very low-hanging fruit things that we can do. But we've also talked about that you can't necessarily be it if you can't see it. So activities that Sport Radar are doing, um, ASTN, GSIC are working to create visibility that women do work in this sector and that it is a great place to work. And I think the key thing that I really heard um, was this idea that our skills are transferable. So um, tech is design, tech is coding, tech um, and innovation and digital can be um, all sorts of creative things that we often do think women are really good at, but they might not necessarily see that, that transfer of talent. And in sport, we really understand talent transfer. We steal athletes from one code and put them in another code all the time. Our AFLW is a great example of that. So we can do that in our sports sector as well. So I'm going to throw to the floor. Bianca, why should women come and work in sport tech? Look, I think women have so much to bring to the table. They have such a different um, thought process to to other, other genders or other um, diverse backgrounds. And I think that's what we need when it comes to innovation. We need different ways of thinking, new ways of thinking. That's how we get to that innovative um, approach and continue to drive sports tech innovation. Um, we specifically uh, provide uh, training opportunities. We have an academy for uh, people. So if I uh, look specifically at Sport Radar, that is um, to our, our all of our employees, but specifically to our tech innov uh, innovation teams as well. So I think it's just going to be really important that, that women continue to, to strive to help drive sports tech uh, innovation. Fantastic. Todd. You know, as I've listened to the other uh, panelists today, what really has struck me is this is a wonderful opportunity for the students I brought to Australia to listen to successful women in this particular sector of the economy and getting the word out that this is a, a career option and an opportunity is the first hurdle that you need to get over. So my hope is that as students in my uh, program have listened to this, that uh, opportunities and doors opening to them are something that they've been able to appreciate. Fantastic, thank you. Iris. Uh, I think the data accompany to promote the women. You know, in the Olympics, in several countries, the women won more medal than the male, you know? And when the women uh, want to go ahead with something is the best. No, <laughs> I think in this, in this end, and and again, sorry to to again again say we need to promote uh, and work with the school, with the girls to show them they can uh, continue uh, practice a sport, a study, a STEM career, and and help the sport industry in work together. No, I, I, and I believe the men and the women can go together and it's not uh, event for women event for i think the idea is 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 only one industry diverse and the the world is diverse no and mm -hmm. and i believe in this and i think in sport you don't have to be good at sport to work in sport tech yeah. so you can live your passion without being any good at playing that's right
Jasmine, last, yeah, that last was, thoughts from you. Yeah, that was a point I was going to make. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, in Victoria, we're a sporting nation. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're a boy or girl, you play a sport in school, tennis, footy, cricket. Um, and I come from an Asian background where sports is not huge. And I used to play netball and tennis when I was young. But then now there's the other side of, of um, the story where as a career, you can actually come be an athlete and then join administration part of, of a sport. And, and I actually came from a tourism background. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea I was going to go into the sports industry, but that skill was so transferable for me. So within the sports tech industry in Victoria and Australia, there's massive opportunities now. It's time for growth and we've grown come opportunity for everyone. So I strongly encourage women to consider that opportunity now. It's the best time to do that. Fantastic, thank you. Um, thank you all very much for presenting. It's been a wonderful discussion. It's a nice way to start the work week for those of us who are working. For those of us who are here watching, thank you very much for being such a wonderful audience. And I think we're allowed to now let you make some noise and give our panel a small clap of applause. And for those of you who will be watching remotely later, thank you for joining us. Um, EASTN will have uh, links to any other programs. Please reach out and get in touch with us and uh, enjoy the rest of the Digital Innovation Festival. Thank you.